Okay, so um, we are going to just finish up the accessory organs. The last one to talk about is the spleen. Um, you can see where the spleen is located here, and it basically fits in between the kidney and the stomach. It's technically, a, or anatomically, I should say, a large organ. Uh, location for the spleen in anatomical terms. We are going to have this in the left hypochondriac region, which you'll remember is part of our nine quadrant abdominal system. So if you have some sort of pain around here, it could be related to the spleen. Uh, it is going to be inferior to the diaphragm. And it will be posterior lateral to your stomach. Okay. Again, this location means that it has to fit in between the stomach and the kidney, so it's a snug fit. Snug fit to your stomach and your kidneys. Now, because of this snug fit, and that's what you can see here in this picture, you actually have two indentations. And these two indentations are where the stomach and the kidney prop up against or push up against the spleen. The stomach is known as the gastric area. And how about the kidney? Any, anyone have any idea what we would call that? Yeah, the renal area. So those indentations are going to be the gastric area where it butts up against the stomach and the renal area where it butts up against the kidney. And I do have a slightly different appearance or picture for that that also shows some of the blood supply. What you can see here in this picture is that right in between the gastric area and the renal area, is where the blood supply comes through. And so the vessels that supply blood and remove blood from the spleen protrude at an anatomical structure that we refer to as the hill. <laughs> and what you can see there are the splenic vein and the splenic artery. So the vessels that are going to be present protruding from the hill be the splenic vein and the splenic artery. But we are also going to have our lymph supply here. So lymph vessels leading into or drawing out of the spleen that come true through the hill. Now if we take a look at the spleen in cross section in prepared histology, we are going to be able to identify two major two major tissue types. And those two major tissue types are collectively just known as pulp. The two types are going to be red pulp and white pulp. Now, the appearance of the pulp being white or red, and you can actually see here is the different tissue types. So we have our red pulp that looks, in this figure, very red, and then the white pulp, which are more nodules, splenic nodules. It appears to be purplish or pinkish in this histology, and that's just simply the same. If we had more of a natural color, we could see that it would be more of a red color. And you probably can already figure out why it's red and why it's white, why some of it's red and why some of it's white. 
We got blood supply. The red area is going to be associated with erythrocytes and red, the red blood cells, and then the white area is going to be associated with those lymphocytes, the white blood cells. So red pulp, lots of our RBCs or our erythrocytes. And then white pulp. Is white because of the presence of lots of white blood cells, including leukocytes and macrophages. Leukocytes and macrophages. So we've spent like three days on the anatomy of the system here, and we haven't really talked much about physiology. And we're about to shift gears, and we're going to begin to talk about physiology. And when physiology of the lymphatic system is discussed, really it comes down to immune function. So the physiology is immune physiology or immunity. Well, what exactly is immunity? Immunity is going to be defense against pathogens and against toxins. Okay, so pathogens and toxins. Now, the term immunity and this defense, it's really a defense system. And so when we describe it, we actually use a lot of military terms, especially defensive military terms. We have three lines of defense in this army of immunity. Now, of these three lines of defense, and we're going to deal with each of them, the first two are non-specific lines of defense or non-specific resistance. Non-specific resistance. And all that means is that the defense that is utilized is not specific for a specific pathogen. It's just going to be a general attack, a, ge a general defense against pathogens and toxins. The third line of defense, which would properly be, to be called the immune system itself, is a very specific response. And so you may get a specific type of virus, and the response to that virus is specifically geared to destroy that virus. So again, I, again at the very beginning of the lymphatic system, we discussed that the lymphatic system is not synonymous with the immune system. The immune system is just a part of the lymphatic system, and in fact, it's this third line of specific defense or specific resistance towards uh, pathological and toxins, pathological infection and toxins. All right, so let's take a look at the first line of defense. Our first line of defense is what you can see. It's going to be mechanical barriers. So we have things like the skin or the integument. That cover most of the exterior of the body, in fact, all of the exterior of the body. And then even as we begin to go in some of the 
cavities and openings that we have, whether it's digestive system or the reproductive system or the urinary system or the respiratory system, those openings have an extension of the epithelium that surrounds or makes up the uh, epidermis and makes up the skin uh, that extend into those openings and those cavities, and that's going to be mucous membranes. And collectively, these two different coverings are going to provide deterrent of entry. We're going to deter entry of pathogens and microorganisms. All right, so the skin is uniquely designed to accomplish this deterrent, this deterrent. so to, to deter this entry from invading organisms. If you think back to last semester, the skin, the integumentary system, is the first physiological system that we talked about. You remember that the epidermis has five different layers. The very top layer is going to be consist of a layer of dead cells that contain keratin. So these are dead, dead keratinocytes. In this keratin, that we find concentrated in the stratum corneum is going to be difficult to penetrate. So we just simply have a defense, a blockade already in existence that's going to be hard to penetrate for microorganisms. But that's not where this ends. Whether or not you believe it or realize it, you are all constantly sweating. And as you are constantly sweating, most of the time we call this imperceptible perspiration. And that causes a coating to be laid down on the skin, a coating of sweat. Now, sweat in itself is not just a water solution. It's a water solution that contains a bunch of really important stuff. We make it a little bit acidic because sweat contains lactic acid. So your skin, because of the presence of the lactic acid inside of sweat, has a slightly lower pH. This makes <coughs> that environment to be uh, inhospitable to pathogens. So reduces pH, increases acidity. This is known as the acid mantle. So not only do we make penetration difficult, but we also create this acid mantle. So as microorganisms try to work their way in, they're continually existing in this inhospitable environment. And we actually even go a step further. The skin contains antimicrobial proteins. So we contain antimicrobial proteins. And these include proteins like dermocidin <coughs> and defensin. And the cathelcedins. So dermocidins, defensin, and cathelcedins. And these antimicrobial proteins are going to cause the microbes that get on the surface of your skin, uh, they're going to break them down and they're going to provide some uh, additional defense. Okay, so this is just the skin. Now, all of the openings and cavities are also going to be covered up by our mucous membranes.
So these are going to be openings, digestive, reproductive, urinary, respiratory tracts, all have mucous membranes. And these mucous membranes <coughs> produce mucus, which aids in the defense process. So this is a sort of sticky substance that's generated by these mucous membranes. And when it is present, it catches microbes. And once they are caught, they are, the microorganisms are either destroyed or just simply excreted. And you may know some of this as snot. When you blow out of your nose or you cough up mucus and phlegm. Or some people cough it up and then swallow it. <laughs> mucus also contains lysozyme. And lysozyme is an enzyme that can dissolve cell walls. Now notice I say cell wall there, I didn't say cell membrane, cell wall. You find around several or many of our bacterias. And so we can actually begin to break that cell wall down of those organisms and they'll fall apart. They'll no longer be resilient. The mucous membranes also incorporate hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid causes an increase in the viscosity of the ground substance. An increase in the viscosity of the ground substance. So the ground substance of the mucous membrane. So the extracellular fluid is thicker, it's more viscous, and that more viscous solution becomes harder to penetrate. There's a question. Hyaluronic acid, H-Y-A-L-U-R-O-N-I-C-A-C-I-D. Hyaluronic acid. And this basically just increases viscosity, and because it's thicker, it makes the mucous membrane harder to penetrate. And really, we're trying to protect, you know, we have these coverings, the cell, the cell layer, and we're trying to prevent the microorganisms from getting into the tissue that's below that cell layer, the fats, the muscles, and blood supply, that kind of stuff. Now, there's additional things that we could talk about in uh, first line of defense, things like the emanation reflex, we have the ability to vomit. So if you consume food that's bad or tainted, you pray to the porcelain god and Keep that out, and that's a mechanism to try to remove the uh, infection that you've created. Um, obviously, mucus and blowing your nose and um, getting rid of that mu mucus tainted with microorganisms is beneficial as well. And those would all be parts of the first line of defense. Um, it's important to wash your hands and things like that, but there's also some studies that show that some people wash their hands too much and they actually increase, because they're getting rid of, especially on the skin, things like those antimicrobial uh, uh, proteins, and they're adjusting the pH to be less acidic. And this actually reduces the beneficial aspects of the, um, of the skin. Now, I'm not saying go to the bathroom and you shouldn't wash your hands every time. You should still do that, but people who use, I mean, there are a lot of people here, you, there's um, all over campus um, the hand sanitizers, and you can go and you can get some hand sanitizer, and people, every time they see one, they'll use it. 
and it's actually counterintuitive to what they think they're doing because they're wiping away. They're, they're destroying those bacteria at that time, but they're changing the chemical nature of the skin, and actually, after a short amount of time, they're more susceptible towards entry of a microorganism. So, you know, you go in and keep your hands all nice and clean, and then you go in and flush the toilet, and you just contaminate your hand, and it's easier to penetrate. Use your foot, by the way. <laughs> It's kind of hard on a urinal. <laughs> All right, second line of defense. First line of defense deters entry. Second line of defense, entry has been breached. So the barrier has been breached. This is still going to be non-specific. There's not a specific sequence of events that's going to occur for a specific pathogen. Second line of defense is called upon or is utilized when pathogens have made it across the barrier. The cell types that are utilized here in the second line of defense uh, are going to be things like leukocytes and macrophages. Which are phagocytic cells. So these cells of, let's say, bacteria enters into, I don't know, your respiratory tract. And enters into that tissue, macrophages and leukocytes will come up and they will try to chop up that bacteria to break it apart, break it down, and remove it from, uh, from the tissue. They will also consume foreign debris. So here this could be toxins. Or in debris. So maybe you breathe in, uh, I don't know, some pollute and it gets incorporated into your tissue. Macrophages looks like to come up and try to chop that up to eliminate that. Um, in addition to the cells, we also have antimicrobial proteins here. part of our second line of defense. And these antimicro my, antimicrobial proteins, they're two systems, and they're a little bit different. They're not dermicidins and cathelicidins uh, and defensins. They're actually going to be um, two different systems. One are the interferons, and the other is the complement system. Okay, so, so two different systems of antimicrobial proteins. The first is the interferons, which I think if I was a protein, I'd probably want to be an interferon because that's just a sweet name. I'm an interferon. Well, what do you do, interferon? Well, <laughs> so interferons, what do they do? They are important in, envir in viral infection. So if we have viral infection, and let's say that viral infection is of a leukocyte. Which virus typically come in and they begin to attack cells. Some of them will be leukocytes. And so the virus begins to be um, incorporated into the genome of the leukocyte. That's how the, they're going to use them. Let me rephrase that. Not being incorporated directly in the genome, but they're using the genomic machinery to reproduce the proteins to rebuild themselves so that they can replicate and duplicate their numbers. So you got the host cell and the virus, and then we really have viruses that are going to be produced in a high quantity. Eventually that cell is going to break apart 
and more viruses are going to expand out into the tissue, more cells are going to be attacked. Okay? So this initial stage, the virus attacks the leukocyte, the leukocyte begins to generate the viruses, and alongside of those viruses, the cell also responds to promote and produce interferons. So when the virus attacks the leukocyte, this promotes release of these antimicrobial proteins called interferons. And this is just simply a class of protons, uh, of proteins, sorry, that are going to be released from the cell that's being invaded by the virus. So you can see these interferons are being produced and they are released. And what they do is they go to other cells in that same general region. It's more of a paracrine type response. And the interferon acts as a warning or a flag to other cells. So a warning or a flag, this is supposed to be not of, but for, warning or a flag to other cells. And basically says, hey, I'm being attacked by a virus, and these other cells respond, and they say, oh, i got to prepare for an incoming attack. And so they begin to generate resistance to viral attack. As the interferons are released, they are going to bind to the receptors that are on the membrane or bound in the membrane of non-affected cells. So you should be able to generate interferons and you should also have expressed in your cell membrane interferon receptors. It's a signaling system that leads towards a cellular response to prepare for a viral infection. So the cell is going to shift its physiology and it's going to begin to produce commodities that are going to help to protect it against the viral infection. And those commodities are going to be antiviral antiviral proteins. And then once the protein or the virus interacts with that cell, hopefully it's primed enough that it can fight off that viral attack. We do have a second antimicrobial system. It's referred to as the complement system. So this is another host of proteins that are going to help out with this second line of defense. Now, the complement system, the complement proteins, they are produced by the liver. So the proteins are produced by the liver and are produced even when there is no infection. So we always have complement proteins present, circulating in our bloodstream. But most of the time they are circulating in an inactive form. That wasn't even close. So they circulate in this inactive form. And the way that we denote or um, provide nomenclature for these cells, or, I'm sorry, these proteins, is, is to provide them with a C plus some number. So, for example, one of the complement proteins is C3.
Okay, so the protein, C3 is the inactive form, and it's always expressed. You can always find complement proteins in the bloodstream. Now, what activates a complement protein? The complement protein is activated by pathogens. Now, upon uh, pathogen invasion, the complement proteins are activated, and they are activated by converting into fragments. So the complement proteins are going to be fragmented. When they are fragmented, we change the nomenclature just a little bit. And so a fragmented complement protein will be denoted by the addition of a letter. So our example of the C3 complement protein, when it is in its fragmented form, it would be maybe C3A, just to denote that it is now a fragment. And the fragment is going to be active. And we're going to get to what an active complement protein fragment actually does here in just a second. But before we move on, that invasion by a protein or by a, a, a bacterial cell is going to initiate the complement system, the fragment of the complement proteins, in one of three different ways. All right, so we initiate defense in one of three ways. Okay, so here you can see all three of the pathways. Um, you can see our fragmentation step, and then eventually we're going to have the formation. We ultimately have the formation of a pole that gets pore that gets inserted into the membrane of the invading protein, uh, invading microorganism, and that makes the the cell much more permeable to things like water, and the cell will just fill up with water and burst. So here are three different uh, initiation pathways, the alternative, classical, or lectin pathways. Okay, so we'll start out with the classic. Classic pathway. So in the classic pathway, which is here in the middle, this is our invading cell. Okay, so this is our microbe, and the surface of the microbe on the cell membrane, you should recognize or remember that we have incorporated proteins and glycoproteins and glycolipids that make up the glycocalyx or the fuzzy cell. Okay, so this is going to be centered around those proteins and sugars that are on the surface of the membrane. In the classic pathway, your immune system produces an antibody that interacts with an antigen. So this is being produced by you. The antigen is what is on the membrane or bound into the membrane of the microorganism. So both of those or that interaction is going to be required. That interaction occurs in the classical pathway. And this basically is the signal leads to downstream events that changes causes a change in physiology. One of the changes is to chop apart or fragment our inactive complement proteins to produce our active fragments. And you can see here we have a C3A fragment and a C3B fragment. There is no C3PO fragment. Now we have a cascade of events here that produces more of these proteins, leading towards a large number of fragments that are available to um, begin to attack and, and destroy this um, microorganism. 
We're going to get to everything down here in just a second. We're working just right here now talking about how this actually happens. So antibody interacts with the antigen, have a series of downstream effects, changes in cell physiology that lead towards that fragmentation process. The alternative pathway In the alternative pathway, the microorganism comes in and it's present, and there's really no interaction between the microorganism like we have with the antibody antigen, but rather we just have complement proteins that dissociate spontaneously. And so as the complement proteins are dissociating spontaneously, you can kind of think of this as a dance where we have a lot of inactive proteins and then we're kind of always just producing some new active proteins, very low uh, expression level. But when the protein, uh, when the microbe is present, those randomly produced fragments that are spontaneously formed will bind the pathogen. Okay, so this is happening very random, at random. Now, once we have that binding that occurs, this leads towards another protein cascade that produces more protein fragments. And so we have a very low level of fragmentation happening at random, and then in the presence of microbes, this fragmentation process speeds up. So our fragmentation speeds up. This is known as the autocatalytic effect. Now, our final interaction here is the lectin pathway. And we have lectins that are proteins that can bind to sugars. And in most cases, it's the sugar mannose, which is very common on microorganisms. They're uh, within the um, membrane of uh, bacterial cells. So these lectins are present and they bind the sugars, in particular sugars like the mannose that we find bound up in the membrane of microorganisms. So the microbes have carbohydrate markers on their cell. surface. And this interaction between the sugar and the lectin are going to lead towards a, the cascade. And we have the cascade of converting inactive fragments into or inactive proteins to active fragments. More proteins produced. So ultimately, we're leading, whether we're using classic alternative or lectin pathway, we're leading towards an increase in complement fragments. Increase in complement fragments. 
And what we will do is we will begin to talk about that the result, the net result of increasing our fragment number on Friday.